This is John from Global Traveler. Today I'm talking travel with musician extraordinaire Billy Vera. How are you, sir? I'm great, man. How are you? Thanks I for having me. It's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to talk to you. I've, I've followed your music for years, and it's just an honor to, to speak with you at this time, sir. Let me jump right in. Right in the beginning, your father was a TV announcer. Your mom was a singer. So is it natural for you just to go into the entertainment business? Well, I guess since I was five years old, I, that, that's all I've known is show business. So I was around it, you know, uh, from day one. So it, it, it just came naturally. Of course, later on, I was in the first rock and roll generation, you know, uh, Frankie Lyman and Fats Domino and Chuck Berry and all that. So I, I, I saw those guys on TV and I, I said, that's what I want to do. I want to do that. Was there any pressure on you then, you know, coming from an entertainment family and now you're trying to forge your own career? Oh, no, quite the opposite. Uh, you know, they knowing how uh, difficult show business is a, of a nut it is to crack. They uh, they wanted me to get an education, but uh, I was bored by school. You know? So <laughs> I, I just uh, got rid of that and just went on to rock and roll. And I know, you know, you've, you've done your own music, but you, you've written a lot for other people. When you write for other people, are, are you writing for somebody specific or are you just trying to put out a good song and then finding a home for it? How does that process work? Well, both. Uh, the first song I ever took to a music publisher uh, got recorded and became a hit record for Ricky Nelson, a song called Mean Old World. And, uh, you know, not many New York writers... Uh, got Ricky Nelson records because Ricky was out on the West Coast and uh, and so they had more access to Ozzy and, and all that. But uh, my publisher, you know, made the connection. And so on Broadway, where all the songwriters congregated and had the offices and the publishers and record companies had their offices, suddenly, uh, in those days, it was a college, cottage industry. It was not the big industry that it has become. So everybody knew my name suddenly. And here I am, this 21-year-old kid with a Ricky Nelson record. And uh, so all the doors were open to me. And I could just knock on doors and peddle my songs here and there. And finally, uh, I got offered a job as a staff songwriter at a publishing company, a, a big one called April Blackwood Music, which was owned by CBS and uh, Columbia Records. And they gave me a little office and a little piano and, uh, you know, told me to write. And they put me with a fellow named Chip Taylor, who, as it turned out, went to my high school. He was four years older than I. Wow. And Chip, of course, is well known for songs like Wild Thing and Angel of the Morning. And he was sort of a mentor to me. And the first song that he and I wrote together was Make Me Belong to You, which became a hit for a girl named Barbara Lewis. Uh, so we were we were going. And then every once in a while, you know, your boss would come in and he'd say, hey, um, you know, the Shirelles are recording next week. See if you can come up with something for them or Tony Bennett. Or So you would have to write uh, with that person in mind, you know, their vocal range. Um, also the the kind of subject matter they like to sing about and so it became a craft you know uh, to write a song as well as an art and then you know the rest of the time i or chip and i would be writing for what we liked you know something it, and and chip and his partner ted darrell who wrote a song called she cried uh they they thought i was a pretty good singer so they wanted to, you know, try to make records with me. And, um, you know, little by little, we put a couple out and they didn't do so well. And, and then uh, the Barbara Lewis record had gotten, uh, gotten me entree into Jerry Wexler, who was the head of Atlantic Records at the time. And so we were able to bring songs to him. So Chip and I had an idea to write a duet song uh, in hopes that a couple of Atlantic artists would record it. Well, we made a demo and a demonstration record. Uh, 
and we played it for Jerry and he pounded his fist on the desk and he said, man, that's a smash. He said, get rid of the girl on the demo and I'll record you on Atlantic Records. Well, cool. to, to me, Atlantic Records was the greatest label of all time. You know, all my favorites were there, you know, the Coasters, the Drifters, sure. Bobby Dan, you know, just you name it, Ray Charles, my hero. So first of all, to have my name on a song on Atlantic Records was a great thrill. And then the idea of having my name on there as a singer, well, I mean, that doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> so we auditioned, well, first we, I was friendly with Patti LaBelle and the Bluebells who were Atlantic artists. And one of the girls in the group, uh, Nona Hendricks, uh, she had a voice that I thought would blend with mine. So I, I called her up and I said, you want to make a record with me? You know, no contractual problems because you're already on Atlantic. She said, I'd love to. So we recorded this song. And um, then their manager got into the act and he was afraid of Nona and I had a hit that, the, that, that she'd leave the group. So then we had to audition about 20 more girls and none of them were right. They all sounded like they should be singing Stephen Sondheim songs or something <laughs> like that, you know? And uh, so finally, Jerry Wexler suggested uh, this girl, Judy Clay, who was the, the cousin, adopted cousin of Dion and Dee Dee Warwick and Sissy Houston, you know, yeah. mother of young Whitney. So we, we auditioned Judy and she was great. And uh, so we, we put her voice on the record and, and it came out, it became a, a hit. Well, and, yeah, I was going to uh, ask, you know, you know, that was thought to be the first interracial duet to chart. Did you realize at the time when you were doing it, the, the historical significance of that? You know, we weren't really thinking along those lines. We just wanted the best voice you know, for my, to, to make, to fit with my voice. Cause I kind of sang in a, in a soulful style, but it, it, it didn't really make an impression on me in the regard that you speak uh, until we got a, an offer to play the Apollo theater. Now I had been a customer at the Apollo theater. You know, I had seen James Brown there and all these great artists and, um, so we show up, the way it worked in those days, the Apollo was a seven day week job and five shows a day. And you would come in at the end of the final show of the previous week to rehearse with the house band. So I show up and uh, the stage manager was a fellow named uh, Honey Coles of the great tap dance team, Coles and Atkins. And uh, he took a look at me and he said, oh, he said, Harlem hasn't seen you yet. <laughs> and he said, but I got an idea. Now this, bear in mind, this is a month after Martin Luther King was murdered. And there was, a, there was riots going on across the river in Newark, New Jersey. And so they were understandably a little queasy. So, but, but Honey said, look, Judy, you enter from stage right. And Billy, you enter from stage left and let her take three steps out. And then you make your entrance and watch what happens. So the first show, Friday morning, 1030 in the morning, place is packed because we had a hit record. And he put us on second, which is not a great spot. You know, the, the, the opening act is always a, an act that usually has a lot of great dance moves, you know, a lot of choreography, flashy to get the audience excited. The next act, the second act, which is where we were, is somebody new, not that well known, maybe not that great. And then it gets better, better, better. And then finally the star, the headliner. So I, I look at Judy, she's across the stage. And I let's wait for her to take her three steps. One, two, three, I enter. 1500 people gasp. <laughs> And I could hear them out there in the audience going, that's him? That skinny little white boy, that's him? <laughs> and, uh, well, we killed. We murdered him. And uh, after the first show, Honey Coles comes up to our dressing room and he says, uh, I'm going to 
I'm going to change up the show. He said, uh, he said, uh, I'm going to put you on right before the star. He says, cause ain't nobody going to follow you too. Wow. And that, that became our spot forever. Whenever we played the Apollo. And so we, we went over great. And, and 20 years later, I'm producing Lou Rawls and, uh, and we, he has a, a benefit to do at the Apollo. So we have dinner in, in, uh, at Rayo's, the famous Italian restaurant in East Harlem. And, uh, and then we go up to the Apollo in the stage door, which is on the, in the back of the theater. And, and the little vestibule there is shoulder to shoulder packed with men and no women at the time. And, uh, and, and holding court was a guy named uh, Ralph Cooper. You might not know him. He was a, a great black actor, uh, been in movies, and, and he, he was very well known in Harlem. He was like sort of the unofficial mayor of Harlem. And he's holding court there. He's talking to Lou and looking over Lou's shoulder at me. Now, I, I had put on a few pounds and lost my hair by that time. I didn't look like the same Billy from 20 years earlier. And suddenly he figures out who I am. And he says, Billy Vera. He says, come here, boy. And I go over to him and he throws his arms around me. He says, I want everybody in this room to know what this man did for our people. Wow. He said, your picture with Judy Clay is down in the lobby and it will always be there. And I tell you, I'll tell you, man, until that moment, I don't think it really fully hit me the impact of what Judy and I did, you know, uh, and I, I, I almost lost it, man. I almost tears in my eyes, you know, because you don't think of what you do for art uh, as anything socially significant but there it was you know no it's like i said it's, it's thought to be the first interracial duet that's amazing especially considering the time everything that was going on for you to accomplish that and to be so successful it, it obviously did wonders for the music industry but also for race relations and even you know history yeah, yeah. moving moving along you also had a big part in two TV shows. You had a, a major hit with At This Moment. I know it was before the show, but it was played on Family Ties. And you also did the theme song for King of Queens. So you, oh. you're in you're in television history as well. For the, the King of Queens theme, did you is that just the only bit you wrote, or is that part of a larger song and they whittle it down to that? No, they they need usually need about 30 seconds for uh for a theme song and the way that happened was i get a call one day from a friend of mine he said uh, listen i just got hired to be the the head of music for uh, columbia pictures so we got a new tv show coming on we got a theme song we're kind of we're kind of stuck with it. there's no place for you to write anything because we, we're kind of stuck with the song he said but come over and take a listen to it and tell me what you think so I, I listened and I said, I said, what's the show about? He said, it's basically the honeymooners, you know, fat, stupid husband and a hot, smart wife, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and I said, okay. He said, he's, she, he said, he's like a UPS driver. So in, in Queens, New York. So I listened to the song and I said, man, I said, this sounds like Paul Simon's idea of what a country song should be. I said, it doesn't sound right to me, you know, for a guy from Queens. He said, you know, I'm thinking the same thing. He said, he said, is there anything you can do about it to fix it? I said, well, yeah, it's got to be kind of dumber, you know, because the guy's not the brightest bulb on the Christmas tree. And uh, he said, I said, let me use my band, uh, you know, the Beaters, and we'll, we'll go in and record it. So he set it up. And we recorded it one take and it was perfect. And he said, do another one for safety. So we did two takes. We're out of there in a half hour. Wow, wow. And the show takes off like crazy. I mean, in, in Germany and Austria, I'm starting to, I, I was starting to get emails, you know, when are you going to put out King of Queens, Steve? 
It would be number one in Germany. You will be bigger than Hasselhoff. <laughs> you know, because you know, Hasselhoff became a big singing star. Sure, I think, yeah. Germany. And, uh, but there was nothing we could do about that. But, you know, to this day, the show lasted nine years. This is the 25th anniversary of the show this year. And I still get checks from it all the time. You know, I mean, like hit record money, you know. Sure. So I'm very grateful for that phone call. <laughs> so let's talk a little travel. You've been, you've played clubs all over. When you're at a club, when you're going to play a club, do you get to see the city at all, or do this all? Do the cities kind of become a blur, and you're really just focused on the clubs? You know, I'll be frank with you. I I didn't travel that much, um, with with you know tour touring. It was too expensive. You know, if, if you're a four piece, 22 year old band and you're willing to all drive in a van and you're willing to all sleep in the same hotel room, it's, it's fiscally doable. But it, in my case, I had an eight piece band with all professional musicians that needed to be paid a decent salary that, that needed their own hotel room, each guy. Sure. And, it was just too expensive to travel. You know, I, I never got to the point where I, I could afford to, to tour like that. So I really didn't see much. You Generally, what you do is we did one bus tour, but you, you go in there and you play the gig and, and then you're off to the next one. So you don't really get to see. The one place we did get to see, because they, they, they had a guy that was sort of our wrangler you know, in Kansas City. And he 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 drove us all, or those of us that wanted to go, me and, and a couple other guys, wanted to see the, the city. Number one, Kansas City has the best meat if, if, if you're a non-vegetarian uh, in the country. I mean, it's just after Los Angeles meat, which tastes like cardboard, I mean, that, it was like heaven for a meat eater. But he also showed us around the, the, the town, you know, where, where, you know, Kansas City was a great music town in the, in the 30s. You know, Count Basie came from there, Charlie Parker, Joe Turner, all these wonderful musicians came from there. And we sh we, he showed us the place where all the clubs were back in the old days. He showed us where the, the tunnels were, where Tom Pendergast wow. ran, the, ran the town. And of course, out of that came, you know, the for my money, the the only great president in my lifetime, which was Harry Truman, you know, uh, uh, and so I got to see some of that, and and it was it was for me it was really cool. Uh, I, I wish I had had more time. Uh, when when at this moment was out, uh, when I made the follow up album, uh, Capitol Records did a um, a video for my first single. And they sent me to Paris. Uh, and uh, you can see that the song is called Between Like and Love. And there's a lot of Paris, um, uh, you know, in the video, the, the city of Paris. And it's really quite beautiful. Uh, but I, again, I didn't see that much. I ate it at a famous restaurant there <laughs> and stuff like that. I did get to go to England uh, when I was much younger to do a song, but it was, again, it was, I was in the studio, went home. So I didn't get really to see as much as I would have liked to have seen. Um, when I was recording uh, when I, in Memphis and Muscle Shoals, Alabama, you know, I got to see a lot of that and, and the life down there and the culture in the Southern culture, which was quite wonderful. Um, there's people there are so warm. Yeah. Uh, Oh, by the way, where you are, Cincinnati? I'm in. I was in Cincinnati. I'm, I'm in Chicago now, though. Oh, okay. Well, Cincinnati was where my parents worked when I was very young. Oh, okay. On a station called WLW. My dad was an announcer there, and my mom was a solo uh, local celebrity there. She did eleven shows a week on radio and television. Wow. <laughs> yeah, they worked her to death in Cincinnati. <laughs> I, I have great memories, even though I was I left there when I was six years old after first grade. I, I, I have 
often wanted to go back and see. I did go back actually, uh, 1968. So I was about, I guess about 23. Uh, and I, I went back to Cincinnati. I, I did it actually appeared on WLW. Oh, on cool. And, and what was really cool about it was some of the old guys, the crew guys, they, they came up to me and they said, you're, you're Annie's boy, aren't you? I said, yeah. So they took me back to meet all the old timers from the station. Wow. That's great. It was, it was really great. And I had somebody drive me back to the house we lived in on, uh, uh, 1026 Sunset Avenue up in Price Hill. I went to uh, St. William's uh, first grade up there. I don't know if you know the area. Um, not really. I mean, we, we we traveled a little bit around the city just to kind of get a feel for it. It's a beautiful city, but mostly yeah. we, were, we were there for the football game. So Right on the river, you know, that yeah. beautiful river, Ohio River. It's a great town. They got a lot of nice stuff there on that, by that river walk. They're really building it up. Ah, but before well, I, I let you go, I want to encourage everyone to check out your books. I, oh, yeah. I, I have this book. Um, I have got a couple of your other ones. I really enjoy your reading. Tell Thank everybody you. Though, where they can find out more information about Billy Vera, your books, and everything else. Well, go to BillyVera.com. That's my website. Uh, you can find me on uh, on my Facebook fan page. Go there. Uh, I'm on Twitter, Billy Vera. Um, so all that stuff. And, and I'm, I'm playing, I'm still playing with the band. I play with, uh, with the beaters still eight piece band. And, uh, I also play with a big band occasionally, a big 17 piece band, which is a lot of fun. If you can imagine with all those horns and everything behind you. Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, and, well, sir, I really, I appreciate your time. It was great catching up with you. I, like I said, I followed your career for a long time, long before you hit it. Long before uh, at this moment hit it on uh, Family Ties, I was a big fan of yours. I love, I love your songs. There's so many to, to even name, and I, I really appreciate your time, sir. Well, thank you for having me, man. I appreciate it. You have a great day. I appreciate it. You too, my friend. Thanks. Bye bye.